Good afternoon. I'm David Van Slyke, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session titled Healing the House Divided, a conversation with Congressman John Katko. Before we begin this afternoon's program, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. The university firmly believes in free speech and supports everyone's right to their opinions and perspectives. And part of that is being willing to listen to each other. We ask that you be respectful of this event, of our participants and our guests. I'd like to thank Maxwell's information and computing technology team for supporting this event, and in particular, Tom Fazio, the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, and the Maxwell Dean's Office who organized today's talk. Now is, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Vice Chancellor, Provost, and Chief Academic Officer of Syracuse University, Dr. Gretchen Ritter. <laughs> Provost Ritter came to Syracuse in October of 2021 from The Ohio State University, where she was the Executive Dean of Arts and Sciences and Vice Provost. Prior to OSU, Dr. Ritter was Dean of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University, and before that was a professor of political science and vice provost of undergraduate education and faculty governance at the University of Texas at Austin. A political scientist by training, with her doctorate from MIT, Provost Ritter is a scholar of the history of women's constitutional rights and contemporary issues concerning democracy and citizenship in American politics, and we are so delighted that she's participating in today's event. In addition to being the Dean, I have the privilege of holding the Louis A. Bantle Chair in Business and Government Policy. I, in addition to my colleague, Professor Sean O'Keefe, who holds the Howard G. and S. Louise Fansteel Chair in Leadership, are delighted to sponsor this lecture. We're grateful to the Fansteel and Bantle families for their ongoing support of the Maxwell School and Syracuse University. After introductions, we'll have 45 minutes in which Provost Ritter and Congressman Katko will have a wide-ranging discussion, and then we'll have 30 minutes for audience Q&A with our two invited guests. After that, we'll move to the Strasser Commons just down the hall for a reception. I would like to now introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Sean O'Keefe. Professor O'Keefe's professional, personal, and avocational pursuits have been dedicated to public service. Among his different professional positions, Professor O'Keefe has served as Secretary of the Navy, as Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, as NASA Administrator, the Chancellor of LSU, and as C CEO of Airbus. A devoted volunteer to many public, nonprofit, academic, and faith-based organizations, Professor O'Keefe is also a popular professor and consummate student mentor. Sean, please come to the podium to introduce this afternoon's distinguished guest. As a graduate student here at the Maxwell School years, more years ago than I care to remember, I would have never imagined getting an introduction like that from the dean. There's just no chance, you know. It's amazing. Thank you, sir. That was very kind of you. It is my privilege, though, to introduce our featured guest this afternoon, who we are proud to say is one of our own members of the Orange community and a dedicated public service in a most remarkable way. A graduate of the Syracuse College of Law, Congressman John Katko is a native of central New York who started his public service career in Washington, D.C. at the Securities and Exchange Commission followed by an extended tenure at the Department of Justice uh, as an assistant U.S. attorney in Virginia, in Texas, Puerto Rico, and a dominant segment of that time of his Justice Department tenure was here in central New York to prosecute several very high-profile organized crime, narcotics, and gang violence cases. His tireless and successful efforts often earned him the top prosecutor award 
presented over the years by three separate U.S. Attorneys General of the United States of different administrations. After 20 years as a federal prosecutor, he was elected to represent the citizens of the 24th District of New York in the U.S. House of Representatives. Now in his fourth term, Congressman Katko has frequently been referenced by Congress watchers, journalists, think tanks, political pundits, as among the most bipartisan members of Congress of either party. And not coincidentally, one of the most productive legislators with the ability to see his legislative initiatives through to enactment. We look forward to the conversation with the provost and Congressman Katko this afternoon to enlighten us, Congressman, on how you managed to do this <laughs> in this environment, to be sure. Congressman Katko, Provost Ritter, please proceed. Thank you. So Congressman Katko, I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of this event and I want to thank the Fansdales for helping to make this possible. I want to thank uh, Dean Van Slyke for asking me to participate in this. Uh, so I grew up in upstate New York uh, in a family that was uh, had a strong commitment to public service. So it's a real pleasure and an honor for me to be able to talk with a distinguished public servant such as yourself. So I'm so happy to be thank here. Thank you very much. Yeah. So picking up on the theme uh, that was just uh, spoken of, you've been an incredibly effective uh, legislator. Every year you've introduced multiple bills, many of which have become law, and you've done this in a context of an increasingly polarized Congress. Uh, often the bills that you've put forward, you have uh, put forward with Democratic co-sponsors. Can you talk a little bit about how it is that you've managed to be so successful? Um, well, first of all, thank you for being here. And if Sean was surprised that he'd ever be standing at a podium in a, in a situation like this, I'm positively shocked that I'm sitting where I am uh, in a situation like this after all these years. So I'm happy to be here and I'm proud to be here. I, I bleed orange and I love this institution. I'm, I'm really glad to be back. I just wish the football team was a little bit better. <laughs> and my friend Jim Beheim would have a good year next year. That's what I'm hoping for. But um, it, listen, I, it, it's a fundamental thing with me. My, you know, maybe it's from my upbringing. I don't know. My mom always taught me to look at the other side of things, and uh, it, uh, things aren't all one-sided. And when I went, got to, got to uh, Congress, I just was determined that I was going to set a tone for better or for worse, whether it's going to be the end of my career or not, uh, prematurely, to uh, understand the other side and work with them. And so when I got to Congress, there's a couple of things, a couple of things I did right away that I was adamant about. Number one is I was never going to introduce a bill without a Democratic original co-sponsor. So the way it works, you probably know, when you introduce a bill, uh, you, you uh, either introduce it yourself or with a, a number of others, introduce it on the floor of the House, and then uh, others can jump on it. But original co-sponsors are on the bill with you. And I refuse to introduce a bill without a, without a Democrat. And if you do that at the front end, horse trading already takes place before you even submit the bill. And to me, that's a, that's a healthy thing. That's number one. And number two is, I always try to look at the other side and understand that I'm not always right. And I love when I'm in a setting like this to say, well, uh, to ask you two questions. I want you to raise your hand. Number one, how many people are in a personal relationship or have ever been in a personal relationship? All right, raise your hands, come on. How, now, raise your hands if you got 100% of you want out of that relationship. Okay, and uh, Sean, you work for Airbus. Do you get every single thing you want out of every deal for Airbus? No. Of course not. So why the hell should we expect it out of our colleagues in Congress on the other side of the fence, and why should we expect it out of our politicians? And so if you understand that basic fundamental tenet, then you understand where I'm coming from. And so with that, I, I decided not only to just do that, but to vote my conscience always, never, never vote to save my job, and also get involved and understand the other side and engage with the other side. And I got involved in things, became leaders with things, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later, the Problem Solvers Caucus, yeah. each equal number of Democrats and Republicans. And uh, you can't join unless you find someone from the other side to join with you. 
and uh, we do a lot of legislation together with this special infrastructure I think we'll talk about later. But also I'm, I'm head of the moderate wing of the Republican Party. And when I took over, it was 19 people. Now there's 50, there's 46. And the leadership relies on me to understand where the moderate wing of the party is. So not only did I walk the walk and uh, talk the talk, I walked the walk, but I also became an advocate for moderation. I'm proud of it and I'm never gonna back down from doing that no matter what the cost, it's not worth it. But I will say being a moderate means you have to understand one fundamental thing. If the left is pissed off at you and the right is pissed off at you, you're doing a good job. <laughs> and that's basically the truth. And uh, based on that, I'm doing a pretty damn good job, but I'm doing really a great job. So yeah, I can agree on that. It's striking to me that it seems to me that you're really recalling a kind of pragmatist tradition in American mm -hmm. politics, which to my mind has often been part of the genius to American politics. And yet we, it feels like we've lost a lot of that. So I think one of the questions I would have for you is how do we begin to get beyond this deep political polarization that we're experiencing right now? I think in order to get beyond, you gotta understand what's causing it, okay? And I think one of the thing is uh, both sides think they're 100% right and the other side's 100% wrong, which I touched on. But also I think part of it has, you have to take a look at what's happened over the last 20, 30 years. When I was growing up, that's like an old man, but that's truth. When I was growing up, we had ABC, CBS, NBC, okay. and public, public television. That was your four news, news outlets. And the worst thing you could call anybody in the news back then was biased. That's the worst thing. Now, if you're a far right wing nut or a far left wing nut, you can go to some certain media outlet, either on TV or on cable or on the internet, and you can get, you get your itch scratched exclusively and not hear about anything else other than that. And so what I think that's really contributed to this and it's driven the conduct of many people in Congress because a lot of people in Congress are panicked that if some news outlet of a certain sort uh, is mad at them, uh, that they're gonna have a hard time, they might have a primary, they may have a general, and I'm like, I don't care, right? But they do because they're voting to save their job instead of doing what's right. But I think the media plays a very big role in it. And quite frankly, I think in the modern times of the presidency too, I don't think we've had mm -hmm. that dynamic leader that has right. been able to cut through this. And I can, I can point to one from both sides of the aisle yeah. that I thought cut through it. Uh, I thought Reagan did, and I thought Clinton did. They both were appealed to the other side and got things done by working with the other side. We don't have that now, and it, both sides are guilty of it, and we need to get back to that. So I think it's gonna have to start from the top by a dynamic leader in the White House, whomever that may be, Republican or Democrat or non-affiliated, and they've gotta to have to have the ability to get people to say, look, we're gonna work with the other side. I mean, that's what we gotta do, I think, going forward, and, and until something like that happens, I think it's gonna be more of the same, but I, I'm still trying to grow the middle, and my colleagues and the Democrats are trying to grow the middle, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult, no doubt about it. Yeah, the, the media piece is an important part of it. You agree with that? Dean LaDonna? All right, okay, so you're gonna help us figure out how we're gonna address that too, right? All right, excellent. Um, yay for the new house school as well. Uh, and um, uh, so I think another thing that we, we don't always stop to think about or appreciate as much as we should is not only the fact that we are so polarized, but what the cost of political polarization is. From where you sit, what do you think the cost is? Uh, the cost is astounding. First of all, I think if you view any, any, any um, poll in the last decade or two, you'll see that the view of a member of Congress is very low, except if it's your congressperson, and then that's pretty high. But if it's yours, if it's anybody else's, a view as a whole, it's very low. And, and justifiably so. Um, they don't, you don't see, though, in the media, and that's another criticism I have, is you don't see in the media the nuts and bolts of what we do every day. And the vast majority of the bills we do are bipartisan, do get passed, and do get done. We did some very, very good bills this year. Infrastructure is a great example. We got it done in a bipartisan manner. That's incredibly important going forward. We did some incredibly important things in the Homeland Security arena, and the vast majority of bills aren't even contested on the Florida called suspensions, where basically you get 400 out of 435 voting for it, or 425 voting for it, or unanimously voting for it. So a lot of that's happening. But I think going forward, it's, it's gonna be, um, uh, the, the cost is quite severe, and I'll give you one example. Uh, 
when you when you have uh, continuing resolutions instead of having right. solutions to budgets, right? Uh, the cost to the military of a continuing resolution is literally billions of dollars uh, in lost revenue because of contracts that are delayed and and things that happen that because of the funding cycle. Like we just finished the 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 uh, the budget for. It was supposed to start last September 30th or October 1st. We just finished it a few weeks ago. Now it's retroactive. The years have gone, and now we got to go back. That's so inefficient, and just the cost of that alone, I'm not being able to get to a budget, is, is huge. And uh, that's just one example of many. But the costs from a productivity standpoint and from a uh, monetary standpoint are, are tremendous. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of research that says that the ability to pass big bills that solve big problems can only really be done if there's a strong commitment to bipartisanship. So whenever no we're not it. able to get there, it means that we're not addressing the hardest and most important things. Yeah, I mean, take a look at the infrastructure bill. Yeah. It's roads and bridges. It's money that we clawed back that wasn't used during the, from the COVID epidemic, right? That we already appropriated, it already been put out there. So we took money back that wasn't being used. We say, we're gonna fix the roads and the bridges. Our infrastructure is right at 36th in the world now. We're America. We shouldn't be 36th in anything, right? And so um, clawed that back. So I was the first Republican to vote for infrastructure. I, I helped write the underpinnings of it. If we have more time, we can talk about it. Uh, in the Problem Solvers Caucus, I was in charge of writing the underpinnings of it. It, it comes out and all of a sudden it became a partisan issue for reasons beyond me. And um, when I cast that vote, many in my party tried to remove me as head of the Homeland Security Committee as punishment for infrastructure. That's roads, bridges, water systems, things we're supposed to be doing. That's a fundamental job task of government. And uh, so that's an example of how bad it's gotten. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've talked a little bit about how we got there. We've talked a little bit about the cost of this deeply polarized situation. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. How do we begin to get beyond it? Um, we've got, it, it, this is very difficult from a 30,000 foot level. You gotta do what I said at the beginning. You gotta look at the person, other person's point of view. You're not the only person with an idea and you're not the only person with a solution. You have someone on the other side of the aisle who's got a very different set of priorities, very different set of principles. And uh, you know Ronald Reagan, of all people, when he came into office, many of you are too young remember, when he came into office, everyone thought World War III was gonna happen and he was gonna lurch the, uh, lurch this, uh, 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 lurch the American society in, in a totally different direction. And so what did he do? Before he even got into office, he sat down and had dinner with uh, uh, Tip O'Neill many times. Tip O'Neill was a far left liberal from Massachusetts who had an iron grip on the House. And they had a big majority in the House of Democrats. What did those two do together? Social security reform, right? immigration reform, tax reform and tax cuts together. Could you imagine trying to get that done? Any one of those things done now. It's, you know, and he, they did it by understanding that they'll, they'll take some of what they get now and keep working on the rest. And that was re basically Reagan's term. So the far right folks in my party say it's, uh, um, Reagan said he'll take everything now and then he'll work on the rest. No, uh, he said, I'll take what I can get now and keep working on the rest basically. Right, and it's still a win if you get some. You get a lot of what you want. You get a majority of what you want. Okay, you're gonna have to give and take. That's what business is. I mean, what, what business deal do you get? You get everything what you want. It just doesn't happen. So I think that's one thing we have to do is understand that, and we need stronger leaders who are less concerned about being reelected than they are about doing the right thing. I think that's really important. And I, quite frankly, I think it's come to the time where term limits would probably be a good thing. All right. Um, and, I'm, and I'm looking at some of our students out there. This, the message about the importance and ability to understand another point of view as how do you advance as a community, I think is a great message as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about your record. You've passed bills and you've worked in a variety of areas. You've worked on issues having to do with economic opportunity. You've worked on issues having to do with cybersecurity. We've talked about infrastructure, homeland uh, security. Uh, health issues, what are you most proud of? Well, I'm most proud of the fact that I went to Congress and said I was gonna be bipartisan and I wasn't gonna let the place change me and hopefully it didn't. Uh, but from an actual bill standpoint, there's a slew of them in Homeland Security. We had a very important uh, cybersecurity bill passed this year 
um, that mandatory incident reporting for, for hacks that is going to change the dynamic for threats uh, on the cyber realm nationwide. That's big. Infrastructure is huge. Tax reform, I know some people may not agree with it. I thought it was very important. But I'll just take infrastructure to, to tell you, if I can digress just for a second, sure. to tell you how it happened. In 2017, there was a problem solvers call. It's made about 10 people on each side. They asked me to put together this, pro this uh, infrastructure report to use as some foundations for, foundation for legislation. We met with tons of people from all, all over the place, unions, industry, government officials, everything. Came up with a very detailed report and it was issued and it kind of bounced along and nothing really happened with it. This year, uh, they, they asked me to freshen it up and I did it with a, a Democrat, Connor Lamb of Pennsylvania. We presented to a group of governors uh, in, uh, in uh, Annapolis earlier this year, bipartisan governors, Republican and Democrat, and uh, same with the senator, a group of senators and uh, members of Congress. And from there, I knew it was a good idea because the senators took that package and wrote the bill and called it their own. So <laughs> that's what senators do. But um, that bill came through, and I'm very proud of that because I know going forward what that's going to do for the, the physical infrastructure of our country is going to be profound, and I'm very, very proud of that. And that, like I said, seemingly um, logical, completely logical bill became the subject of political whims. That's how bad things are, but we got it through, and I'm very, very proud of we stuck with it. So things like that. Terrific. So we were all shocked 15 months ago when uh, a group of protesters stormed the Capitol in an effort to stop the ratification of Joe Biden as our president. Uh, it was, uh, you know, as, as someone who uh, cares deeply about American democracy, I certainly never thought I would see such a thing happen in this country. Uh, in the weeks that followed, you were one of a handful of Republicans who voted to impeach President Trump for his role in encouraging the group that stormed the Capitol. You also sought to create an independent commission to investigate what happened that day. Can you talk to us a bit about your reflections on the events of January 6th and the aftermath? It's probably the saddest day, not probably was the saddest day that I've ever witnessed in, in, in my, all my time in serving my, gov my country. Yeah. That's been 32 years, hands down. And I saw it unfold in front of me when I was, when I was there. So um, uh, deeply, deeply troubling. Um, and uh, it was the denouement, if you will, of the partisanship that our country's uh, under right now. And what we gotta get, we gotta get back from. I don't think we've learned enough from it, but the, all that aside, uh, it was pretty simple from a uh, what to do standpoint, is I'm a prosecutor. So they had an article or charge, if you will, the indictment, and we had to, we were, the House is like the grand jury. We just vote whether or not to indict. And then we were like, and, then we, and if it does, then someone else goes and tries a case in the Senate. I looked at the evidence, I looked at the charge, and I voted accordingly, and I don't regret it for a second. Um, uh, I think others probably wanted to be with me that didn't for reasons I, I'm more skin saving than anything else, which is a little bit disturbing. But um, uh, to me, it was the right thing to do. And uh, it wasn't based on any sort of uh, self advancement because it was quite frankly the exact opposite. But uh, I was the very first person to announce that I was the very first Republican to announce that I was going to um, uh, vote that way. And walking off the floor, I thought, well, this could be it for me, but it's still worth it. And I, I don't regret it. That, I didn't regret it then, and I don't regret it now. Um, it was a very painful thing to do, um, mm -hmm. a very sad thing to do, something I wish I never had to do, but I did what I thought was right. I know people disagree with me, and that's fine. I understand that, but I looked at it, and I made my decision. The commission you tried to create uh, on the model of the 9-11 commission mm -hmm. never came into being. Um, why do you think that was? And, uh, and I also love your thoughts on uh, what you think of the work of the House Select Committee? Yeah, um, my, my biggest concern about January 6th uh, was something that when you have uh, people investigating themselves, if you will, um, 
which is what they want, the, what this commission is doing now, it just tends to become very political. Look at the Benghazi commission, right? And, it, and, and it, I don't know, I don't know what gets accomplished. I think there's a lot of primping and preening before the, the, before the cameras, but what really happens, what gets accomplished, right? My, mine was more of a finite inquiry, and, and it was, how the hell did we ever let the Capitol be this vulnerable? And how was the Capitol Police uh, command structure so poor that they let those officers hang the way they did? Some of those officers were out there getting the heck beat out of them for four hours, and they were constantly calling in on, the, on the, uh, their, their, uh, their, their microphones saying, what, what's the plan? And they, there was no plan. And they, 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 the intelligence saw this coming. So the whole idea of the commission for me was, how do we make the Capitol safer? And how do we make the Capitol Hill police better? Knowing full well that inquiries from the outside would be very robust. There's committees in Congress, oversight and government reform and all those who could do all these and, 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 and carry them out. So I didn't think it was our role to create a select committee to do all that. I thought our role was to keep it, keep it safe. And what, what was amazing is the other side had um, wanted it to be all this political stuff. And I pulled them through a lot of negotiation and I pulled in every favor I could to get to where we were. Mm -hmm. And it was completely bipartisan and you know, mm -hmm. both sides had agreed to subpoenas. It didn't, wouldn't become a circus. And so that passed the House and 35 Republicans voted for it, but it died in the Senate. And there was mm -hmm. a lot, caught a lot of heat for that too, mm -hmm. of course. What we have now is a very unbalanced committee. Uh, there's not balanced subpoena power. Um, um, and they are making inroads, I would, I would probably argue that, but I'm not sure if the safety and security issue is ever gonna be adequately addressed, and to me that should be the central focus and let the other committees in Congress that are balanced and do have subpoena powers and those other things, let them make, let, let them make the inquiries that happen. And so that was my concern, yeah. if that makes sense. Yep. Um, uh, so as we mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of students in the room. Uh, and I'd love to hear what kind of advice you would give to our students on becoming effective public servants on behalf of all citizens. Well, if you're doing it for ego, don't do it. And if you want to see what's wrong with people that had to do it for ego, take a look at Congress. Right? Don't do it for ego. And if you're doing it for ego, don't find something else. Okay, go on a TV show. Um, but if, if, if you love your country and you want to serve and feel good about serving, be proud about serving, highly recommend it. But don't lose, don't lose sight of that. And if you're going to do it, don't ever do something while you're a public servant just to save your skin and save your job. Okay? You got to sleep at night. And I venture to guess a lot of my colleagues in Congress, when this is all over the back, they'll be kind of like, oh, man, you know? because uh, a lot of them, I think, vote to save their skin instead of vote what they think is right, and that's not good. So I would say, if you're gonna serve, serve for the right reasons, and when you're there, stick to those reasons, and don't, and don't let the place infect you. It was very easy when I was a prosecutor, because, and if anyone's thinking about being a federal prosecutor, I highly recommend it, best job you'll ever have. Um, there's good guys and bad guys. You're the good guy, and if you don't abuse your power, you can do a lot of good things and impact your communities in a positive way. Uh, and uh, there are bad guys in this world, and they do need to be dealt with, right? Not to not to print and print, but to keep your country safe. That's one of our fundamental uh, duties as uh, as, as uh, a government. But in Congress, and we're, if you're going to think about running for election, it's not about ego. And if it's about ego, that's when things start falling apart. It's got to be about being able to articulate your views, whatever your values are, and understand there's another side. If you can't do that, you shouldn't do it. But if you can't do that, go ahead. I, I, we need people that are, that are normal. And we don't need career politicians. People that are normal. Good goal for us. OK. Um, so as we've talked about in various aspects, uh, we're in a moment where demo our democracy is under stress. Mm -hmm. um, it's under stress. I think a lot of people see that dedicated public servants like yourself are becoming more scarce in many ways, uh, and I do think that that uh, people aren't as engaged or as committed as citizens, perhaps, as they once were in some ways, and it's, one can't help but think about the contrast in this moment with a place like Ukraine, where there's 
incredible unity and commitment to answering the challenges and to standing up for the country. What is your sense of this? Do you agree that our democracy is under stress? What are your thoughts about how do we kind of renew a commitment to engage citizenship in this country? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I do agree we're, we're under stress, no question about it, but the foundation of our system is still rock solid. And uh, it's so rock solid that you can act the way you are and still be able to have the country survive. And um, I, I do think we're going through a tough time. I do think we have poor leaders in positions of authority, uh, especially on the very senior levels, uh, especially at the White House the last several terms, and not just Republicans and Democrats combined, that um, are more engaged in divisiveness and in inclusiveness. And I mean, we, need, we need to fix that. It's a recurring theme if you haven't figured it out yet with me. Uh, so I, I do think we need to, that's, that, that is something that we need to work on. Uh, your reference to Ukraine, though, made me think of 9-11. And uh, on 9-11, when, when we got punched in the mouth, uh, we stopped what we were doing. And look at my people join the military and look at my people uh, change their lives for the good of the country and did things that they never thought they'd be doing. And so our spirit's still there. Uh, you know, we're just, um, uh, we're not going through what those poor folks in Ukraine are going through right now. And um, we can be doing more for them, but what they're doing is inspiring but we would do the same thing. There's no doubt in my mind about it if that was the case, if we were, if we were pushing the same way. But I think the, the fundamental, fundamentals of our democracy are fine. It's just we've, we've just got to have better leaders. It's, it's that simple in my mind. And quite, quite frankly, to one more thing, and I'm not trying to dump on the media, so don't get mad at me, but um, you don't hear about a lot of good things that happen in this world, do you? 99.9% .9 of cops go out every day and do a great job. You, you rarely hear about the good things they do. But when they screw up, you hear about it, and you should. But how about hearing about the balance on the other side? How about hearing about the good things that people, that politicians do for their communities? They don't hear about it. I get probably less than a third of the bills I ever even pass I've reported on. We send up press releases on all of them. It's not controversial enough. It doesn't sell. But shouldn't, shouldn't they have a duty to tell you about the good things that are happening too? So that's part of the problem, right? Yeah, the, the controversy sells, and therefore, right. when, you have, uh, when you have the AOCs of the world, or Marjorie Taylor Greens, right? They're outrageous in their comments, the things they say. And so therefore, they get coverage, and then they get clicks, and when they get clicks, they get followers. When they get followers, they got power. That's kind of screwed up. And that's something we gotta work on going forward, I think. Um, let's talk about cybersecurity for a minute. This is this is something you've been deeply concerned about, something you've worked on, talked about this new bill. Uh, why do you think this is such an important issue, and what do you think needs to be done to strengthen cybersecurity in the U.S.? Sure. Well, first of all, five years ago, no one was really talking that much about cybersecurity. The number one threat to our country five years ago from a homeland security standpoint is that since I've been on Homeland Security even, was ISIS-inspired domestic acts of violent extremism. San Bernardino, the Pulse nightclub, all these places where ISIS was, they had people in the Middle East in their geographical area, and they were inspiring massive attacks, bloody attacks in the US. And that was our greatest threat. ISIS is now severely diminished. They're not gone, and they're very serious threats still, but nowhere near what they were. And now I would argue to you the greatest threat to our homeland now is cybersecurity, by far. China, Russia, Iraq, and Iran all have the ability to do catastrophic harm to us at any time. They can press a button at any time and, uh, and activate malware in our water systems. They can do it at any time with our, with our critical infrastructure across the country. And uh, we can do it to them too. So it's, this is the mature MAD concept in my mind, mutually assured destruction. And cybersecurity is just starting to become the priority it needs to be. But if you're, if you're in a corporation or in a business um, and you don't have state-of-the-art cybersecurity, I think what's coming next, and if I was younger, I'd do this. I would love Congress. I'd, I'd, I'd head up a litigation firm and sue those guys for not having state-of-the-art cybersecurity yeah. when they get act because the, the, the technology is out there. And that's really what the genesis of CISA is, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency is. Um, was designed in Homeland Security, and I helped stand it up 
is to form a partnership with the private sector where the cross flow of information regarding malware and attacks is coming at very, on very timely manner. So you, they can take it, they can, they can figure out what the problem is, send the patches out immediately to everybody, right? And they can also have best practices. They can go to your systems and hunt on your systems to find out where the holes are. But unless a corporation prioritizes the chief information officers of their companies, they're gonna struggle. Um, and uh, they're fast starting to realize what's, what, what's going on. Ukraine, ironically, has caused a better partnership with the federal government and private sector on cyber issues than ever before. And the amount of uh, information that's being exchanged is phenomenal. Yeah. And it's just showing that this model is going to work, but it's about awareness and it's about assuming, uh, the best way to look at it is assume as an individual you're next to be hacked, don't get, hope you're not. And assume as a business you're the next to be hacked and don't hope you're not. And if you're assuming that you're the next to be hacked and you act accordingly, uh, we're gonna be a lot better off. We're light years ahead where we were a few years ago. Years ago, mm -hmm. I've ventured to guess in two years, we're gonna be light years ahead where we are now. Mm -hmm. So we're going in the right direction. I, I also wanna ask you about economic development. As a, as a fellow upstate New Yorker my entire life, there's been conversations about how are we gonna revitalize upstate New York. Good things have happened, but mm -hmm. we still have a long way to go. What are your thoughts or reflections on uh, what we can do to increase economic opportunity and foster economic development in upstate New York, and what role can higher education play in that process? Oh, sure. Uh, this is perfect. Um, well, first of all, if anybody, nobody's asked me why I got into politics, I was 52 years old. I love my job as a prosecutor. There's good guys and bad guys. I was a good guy, so it was pretty easy. When I went to cocktail parties, everyone's like, oh, cool. Now I go to cocktail parties, I'm like, you son of a bitch. You know? <laughs> you know? Like, Going to the wrong now, right? All right, relax, right? But um, um, the reason, one of the reasons I did was somebody asked me, first of all, and I had no thought of ever doing it, but I'm gonna forget, when Obama stood there and basically said words to the effect, you know, manufacturing's gone in this country, a lot of manufacturing, you're just gonna have to accept that. It's not coming back. And I don't subscribe to that. And I didn't subscribe to them because I think that our tax laws, for, we had the highest rate of taxes for corporations in the world. And uh, we had the highest amount of regulation on corporations in the world. And the, regu the regulations were crippling us and really impossible for us to compete. And uh, the trade imbalances, uh, what the tariffs they had on our products, we didn't have on theirs and what have you, made the playing field very uneven. So I thought that wasn't right. But um, so I, I always often thought about that. And that's one of the reasons why I went, because I really wanted to get in there and show me we could change it. So that's why I'm very proud of we did a lot of regulatory reforms and a lot of tax reforms that made us much stronger from a manufacturing standpoint. But what we can do at upstate New York is get that manufacturing back. When I was a kid, I, my parents didn't have the money to pay for my, my school, I paid for all myself. And I loaded trucks and worked at factories all through high mm -hmm. school and college to get to uh, pay for my schooling. And I, and I didn't pay off my loans for many years after that, but it was worth it. But the, back then those jobs were there. They're not there as much as they were. I think Amazon's a start, but I think the home run ball for us is technology. And uh, if we get that chip manufacturing mm -hmm. plant, yeah. that is not a home run for Syracuse and Central New York, and not just for New York State, but for the country. Yeah. The amount of money that they're talking about investing, if we get that, is gonna change profoundly upstate New York. And it would change profoundly the universities that surround that. Right. So if you think about it, one facility that they build on that campus is 1,500 jobs that started that average 160 grand a year, average. And um, that facility would take cost five to seven billion to build. And in the next 10 years, they'll build seven more facilities on that same site equal amount of investment, equal amount of jobs created at the same salary level. So you're talking 12, 14,000 jobs minimum, probably many times more than that, very high paying engineering type jobs. So what does that mean for universities? That means universities are gonna play a vital role in pumping out the people that work there, right? And maybe schools that never, didn't even have the curriculum like that are gonna to go to that. And the schools like Syracuse have a very good curriculum in Cornell and, and, and a lot of the others, they're gonna they're going be able to, uh, have people stay here instead of having to go elsewhere to look for opportunities. And the, 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 the effect on the economy long-term would be profound. Yeah. I mean, it would be so good we might even have a good football team. <laughs> Let's not, go that, let's not go that far. But, um, <laughs> but I do think that um, that to me is the home run. I think technology could be something that, that could really change us here in Central New York. Great. 
So you've announced that you will not be seeking a re-election, much to the disappointment of many of your uh, constituents uh, who are extremely grateful for all of your years of public service. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that decision? And can you also talk a little bit about what comes next? Sure. Um, first of all, I'm a firm believer in term limits. And uh, I said I'd never go more than 12 years. And I went eight, and um, that seemed about right. Uh, may, might I have hung on a, a couple more terms? Yeah. But we had some, uh, I, my wife and I lost all four of our parents in the last four years. Oh. And my mother in law uh, was the last one to die, and she died but, but tragically last year. And it kind of gives you pers some perspective. Mm. And I'm 59 years old, and uh, you say, How many good years do I have left? And then I looked over at the far left in Congress, and the far left said, do well, I want to spend them with these guys? <laughs> and I said, no. Um, but no, but honestly, uh, I'm a firm believer in leaving a little bit too early than a little bit too late. Mm. And I really think that um, uh, through a confluence of personal experiences and what I was able to accomplish, uh, it seemed like the right time. Um, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, from a competitive standpoint, I wanted to stay to prove certain naysayers wrong, who sh shall not be named, uh -huh. uh, but uh, that's not a reason to stay. And I was confident, even with the new district, I'd get reelected. Um, yeah. Basically, we did the analysis. I'm pretty sure we would have been. Um, but uh, uh, it just seemed like the right time, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with what I'm doing. Whatever I do when I get out, I don't know. But whatever I do, I definitely want to stay in the public service realm of some sort, homeland security realm of some sort. Uh, it's in my DNA now, so I can't escape it. Uh, and we'll see what happens going forward. Maybe I'll even guest lecture here once in a while. Maybe a guest lecture. Maybe, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Terrific. Well, I'm sure we, we could keep this conversation going um, for a long period of time, but we've, we've got an audience of folks here who I'm sure are eager to ask you some questions as well. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you. So we have two microphones that are going on. If you can raise your hand, I'll point the uh, microphone to you. We've got right here this person right here in the blue suit with their hand up. And then Professor Thompson after that. So Corey, Professor Thompson after that. Yes, sir. Okay. You don't have to stand up. I'm not that important. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman Katko. It's been a pleasure hearing you talk. Um, I've spent the last couple of years in state Republican policy, and it's fair to say that I've been a little bit dismayed with you know just how the discussion goes around in the politics, really on both sides. My former colleagues were great, but it seems like it's harder than ever to make a difference in policy when the two sides are a chasm apart. And if you propose anything other than the most extreme policy, you're a turncoat. Um, so I feel a little politically homeless, and I think a lot of other political staffers and policy people do. What would you recommend to people who are interested in public policy in order to not allow the institution to change them, but to allow themselves to have an actual impact on the policymaking arena? I'm not the second coming of Christ here or anything like that, but do what I did. Do what you think is right, and uh, consequences be damned. And you don't do it without being calculating and smart and looking at the playing field. But there's ways to maneuver the minefields. And uh, I mean, I'm in a district that's far more Democrat than Republican. And, uh, but I still manage to espouse a lot of Republican conservative values, but is also bend, bent on things that I think are important. Most, and I also was mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, my constituents aren't just Republicans, they're Democrats and they're independents, right? And they're liberals and they're conservatives. And I, you, know, you, you don't represent just one point of view. So um, your view is important, as, uh, but also understand where it is. And wherever you end up going from a political standpoint, whether it's a Democrat, Republican, whatever, everybody, don't forget, Ronald Reagan was a Democrat. <laughs> so uh, I'm not saying leave the party. Please don't say that, you know, because that's, don't say that either in news. You'll be saying, Cac live at six, Kako says leave the Republican Party. <laughs> I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is go where you go, whatever your core principles are, stick to those and try and navigate the minefields and advocate in an effective manner that's not just um, your thoughts of you, but understanding the playing field and, and trying to navigate those minefields. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's kind of like a quarterback trying to throw the ball when you have three hundred pound linemen running at you. Figure it out. <laughs> You'll get it. Right. You can do it. Thank you, Professor Thompson. Uh, thank you to both of you for your remarks, your questions, and your responses. Um, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about people that you regard in Congress as your mentors, mm. and also um, who you see, since you are retiring from the House, who you see as carrying the torch forward for this kind of bipartisan work in either party mm -hmm. that we could look for for that kind of role in the future. Thank you. Sure. I mean. One of my mentors, and he's turned out being one of my very good friends, is Fred Upton from uh, Michigan. And he just announced his retirement. And Fred's been around for 30 some odd years. But him and I have become friends, very good friends, and we have a very similar political philosophy. Excuse me. I'm, I'm amazed that he lasted that long because it's exhausting. But uh, uh, Fred and I are very close friends. And there's a lot of people like that that you'll never hear about on both sides. Kathleen Rice on the Democratic side is a good friend of mine. Stephanie Murphy is a good friend of mine. Uh, there's many in the Problem Solvers Caucus that I respect, and they respect me. And uh, um, so I'm confident going forward that there's going to be others that are going to fill the vacuum. Uh, there's a lot of, like Brian Fitzpatrick is, is uh, uh, he, I was his mentor, and now he's kind of taken the lead, and he's going, uh, lead, he's, a, he's the lead Republican on the Problem Solvers Caucus, and He's not afraid to take the stands that need to be taken. And there's always going to be people that are there as long as there's someone to be there with them. It's kind of like you can't be afraid to jump off the bridge as long as you know someone's going with you. Most of the time, not all the time. Uh, I've taken some votes where I was one of the very few jumping off the bridge. But uh, um, there's always going to be some. I just think we have to show that there are others like-minded. And it just, takes, it just takes the ability to say, okay, is this job worth sacrificing the principles over or not? and the job is not worth sacrificing principles over, everything else becomes very easy. And my staff is back there, and I probably gave them heart attacks many times with some of my votes, <laughs> but they were with me, and they would, they would know how to ha help me handle it, help me navigate it. That's their job. So I would say there will always be people, but those people, they will better hire really good staff like I did who know how to uh, implement the message and know how to help you navigate what's coming. Because Lord knows... We knew many, many times that we just punched someone in the face and, we're, and it's going to come back at us, but we were, you know, you got to be ready for that. I don't know if that makes sense. Question on this side? Yes. Right here. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I've been a upstate New York resident for my whole life, uh, and you've been my congressman for the last several terms. So uh, thank you for your service to the central New York community and the United States at large. Um, my question is, what does it mean to be a Republican now versus four terms ago when you first got in there? What are the defining values? Because I'm a little bit lost, kind of like my friend Jim was, Jimmy was saying, I'm a little politically homeless. Uh, if you could, you know, kind of help me out here, that'd be great. No, I, yeah. I, I, I th that's a great question, you know, and that question kind of exposes the, the, the fissure in our party, but there is the fisher in the Democratic Party, too, right? Um, the Democratic Party now is not what it was a few years ago, and the Republican Party now is not what it was a few years ago. I've often said now that I think the, the, the Republican Party has become more party of personality than principles, and we got to get back to the party principles, Reagan-type principles. That's what I think. And uh, um, look, do I want lower taxes? Yeah. Do I believe lower taxes generate and, 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 and spur business? Absolutely. Can you demonize success? No, I mean, that's, that, that's not a good idea. I'm, pro, I'm happy to be pro-life. Some people are pro-choice. That's fine. I respect that. Um, I think less government is, is, is good. I don't think the government's the answer to everything in, in a microcosm. That's a fight we're having with CISA right now. A lot of people on the other side want to make CISA a regulatory agency. And my feeling is you make it a regulatory agency, you'll destroy the partnerships they have with the private sector in about 10 seconds. And so I'm concerned about that as well. So. I think our, we need to go back to a party where we have defined principles. And the good thing about what you're asking is uh, what we're doing with these task forces. And uh, even after my impeachment vote, they made me head of what's called the American Security Task Force. And it's one of seven task forces Republicans are doing to redefine what our Republican values are because we understand that we're somewhat adrift because of what's happened over the last few years. And so I'm, I'm in charge of coming up with a border policy a uh, uh, police issue, uh, deal with the police issues and poli police reforms that need need to be done, 
and uh, cybersecurity. Those are pretty meaty issues, right? So we're, by the time this year is over, we're gonna have a blueprint for that. It'll be a blueprint for healthcare. It's gonna be a blueprint for everything. And you'll see again, and I think that's sorely needed. Your question is exactly why we have these task forces, right? And you'll see, and I think when you see them, you'll, be, you'll feel better about things. The problem is the personalities have overtaken the principles and we've got to get back to, you know, and both sides are guilty of that, really. And, and if, you ask, if you ask a lot of my moderate Democratic friends, they feel the same way you do. So it's a good question. Yeah, go ahead over here. Was, Corey, if you can bring the microphone up here. Thanks. And then we got somebody over in the back row up here next. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting to listen to you talk. I mean, you kind of have this like Jordan. I wish my sons would say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I mean, this was my first time. I mean, obviously, I heard the commercials, everything. I mean, I've been going to Syracuse. I mean, you've heard I'm John Cack when I approved this message? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was good. It got going. I mean, you need that like polarity between you and your opponent, and it seems like you firmly hold your beliefs. You know what you're doing. You have that law background, which I like. You know, uh, you have this like Jordan Peterson esque. I don't know if you know who that is, but you kind of like sound like him, talk like him. It, it's very good. But my question, I mean, I'm here from my political action class, and actually, the whole course we're developing this thing called an action plan. And it could be reaching out to a town hall. It could be mm -hmm. reaching out to a police department. But I mean, you're sitting here right in front of me, so I might as well ask sure, you go what ahead, man. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, thing is go. about. Yeah. I mean. But I was kind of, the final action plan was what can Syracuse do specifically to work on inclusion, diversity, and overall just, you know, functioning better as a city? Because a lot, I mean, you're striving for it every day, but it's sad to see stuff like when you go two blocks down campus and you see Pioneer Homes, like one of the oldest, I think it's one of the oldest, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, basically like a it's just not a good place to live and all that. Do you think it's more the city, you know, the community coming together is the reform you could do? I'm just wondering, you know. No, I know what you're saying. Uh, I got, yeah, I, I got what you're saying. And what can we do to, first of all, you got to acknowledge the problem. Now, that's always the first thing, right? How many people here know that Syracuse has some of the highest concentration of poverty in the United States? Yeah. Okay. And people go to bed Every night in the city of Syracuse, I saw it all the time when I was prosecuted, and it was stunning to me. And some of the back steps I walked up at night trying to find witnesses, and they opened doors, and it was stunning to me. And it was so bad that uh, my wife and I ended up adopting a couple of foster kids. Poor man. Um, so uh, I, I saw firsthand what it was. Trust me. So you have to acknowledge what um, the problem is. And I don't think people anywhere near enough understand it. And then you have to do something about it. So I looked at like, okay, what's the biggest problem with the high poverty areas, right? They're big, the, the, guys that, the guys that people look up to on the street corners are the guys that have uh, uh, driving a fancy car when you're 17, 18 years old, flush with cash and all kinds of jewelry on. The guys that he's in criminal activity and he's not, you know, so that's their role model. Their role model has to be people that are working jobs and are, 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 are making an honest living and that are successful and are advancing, right? And you have to do that. So how do you do that? You got to give them opportunities. You got to intervene at an early age. I've always been a huge believer in Head Start and early intervention with kids, like even before preschool, because uh, you know nutrition is a big thing. You need to understand that literacy by third grade. If you by third grade, if the kids aren't um, by the time they get done talking, you think I'm a Democrat. So hang out here. But uh, um, by third grade, if the kid's not on it, is behind in reading, the chances of them ever catching up are almost non-existent, right? and therefore the dropout rate soars and everything. Um, you've you've got to, uh, they don't have transportation, they don't have access to jobs, right? So Amazon's an example. We are trying to get rapid transit from downtown to, uh, to uh, Amazon and other workplaces so they can, get, they can get to the jobs. They give them a good wage. They give them an opportunity for a free education if they want to go to college. That they can come back home with a paycheck and be proud of it. It starts there, it starts that simple. You can talk about all you want, but everybody needs to do their part. And I think another possible transformational thing, if it's done right, and that's a big if, and that is uh, the Interstate 81 project, uh, you know, it's not going to reconnect things, but it, it will have an infusion of money in areas like, Air, like oh, 15th Ward, which really needs it. And so there's a huge, the Allen Foundation, working, I'm, I'm working with them, and, and a lot of people are, to try and... Uh, understand how profound that poverty is there 
and to help them. Understand that kids that go to school, one of the schools I saw, the 700 kids get uh, all their meals from school. They understand, if they don't get their meals from school, they're not eating, a lot of these kids. So I'm, I have, I'm big in like summer feeding programs and weekends and all that stuff. So all that has to happen, right? But the, the, the end result is you've got to provide education and opportunity for them so that they can then pull themselves up. Okay, because you can't pull them up just by grabbing them by the collar. You've got to give them the opportunity to do it. And we have not done a good enough job with that. But we do have opportunities coming that they can take advantage of. And uh, we've got to make sure we give them every opportunity to succeed. Every opportunity. I think we have a question over here. Taylor. Uh, first off, thank you so much, Congressman Katko. Um, so as a congressman, you are representing um, the central New York area, <clears throat> but you're also working at the federal level and, you know, for a federal Congress. How do you balance the needs of your constituents, uh, maybe like sometimes your party and the nation as a whole? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> that's an everyday tug and pull with me. Think about it, right? The majority of my constituents are not from my party, the vast majority. Two-thirds of them, at least, are not from my party. They're either independents or they're uh, Democrats, right? So in Syracuse, and my, my district offices, I have four of them, we do nothing but casework. So they call us with any issue you can possibly imagine, from a tax issue to VA, VA issues to Social Security, you name it, right? And we have to, we, we, that's what they do in, in Syracuse and in, in the home offices. In D.C., where it's all about legislation, right? But if you don't mesh those two offices, you're really missing out because our legislative priorities in D.C. should, should mirror our, our, our casework concerns in Syracuse, right? And so we constantly are doing that. So a lot of my legislation comes from the fact that my offices in Syracuse interact so well with my, uh, my office in D.C. So if there's issues that arise, we, we go at them. I mean, we just spent today going over all kinds of uh, funding requests we have for different projects in Central New York and prioritizing them with our Syracuse staff and our DC staff. And then we're gonna go, go after that money for them back down in DC. So that's, that's kind of an example. So you really gotta listen. And um, you know, I, I spend two hours when I go to the grocery store, my wife always goes nuts because uh, <laughs> what takes her 10 minutes or 15 minutes takes me a long time because I stop and talk to people. And then if someone wants to say something to me, Generally, I can tell, if, you know, if they're getting a clenched jaw or something, they're going to just yell at me, and whatever, okay, fine. But uh, if it, you, normally, it's very, very constructive conversations, and I learn from them, right? So you got to be able to be accessible and get out there. I've done probably five or six dozen telephone town halls. We reach 10,000 people at a time. What are your priorities? I go to meet people all the time. I've done town halls in person. I was the only one who did three town halls in 81. None of the other politicians wanted to do them because they knew it was going to be raucous, but hell, let it rip and tell us what your concerns are, right? And if you don't listen and you don't take what you hear and put it into action, then you're, you're not doing your job, in my opinion. I don't know if that makes sense, does it? Okay. Questions here uh, up front? Corey? Yeah, I got a hot bench here. Oh, okay. Good question. Thank you, Congressman, for giving us this time. I wanted to ask you a question on shared economies. Uh, with the growing popularity of shared economies around the world, with applications like Uber and Airbnb, many European countries have been regulating and even eliminating these services. Uh, what do you think about these actions, and do you believe in the potential of shared economies and the possibility of wealth creation in When you say shared economies, in what vein? Like, I mean? like Uber and um, Airbnb were person-to-person -person services uh, where they uh, can rent or sell their uh, property. Well, uh, I think that is quintessentially capitalistic, right? So why not, right, as far as I can see? I mean, do I have all the answers on how do you regulate it or does it need to be regulated? If so, how? And how do we protect the consumers? I mean, we're figuring it out, but I think it's, think about it, you know. I was just in New York City last weekend, and I remember New York City, until up until the last five years, you saw nothing but yellow cabs. And now they're almost all gone because you had the, 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 the explosion of, of Ubers. But what a great concept, what a great idea. Now, Airbnb, so I, I don't use my house for six months out of the year. I'm going to go rent it out. Why not, right? It makes sense to me. I think it's a... I think it's the quintessentially capitalistic thing to do, right? And I think it's, uh, um, I guess necessity is the mother invention, they say, and people found, found, a, found a niche and they found a need and they're, they're using it. Hell, I took an Uber home from 
the airport last night, 1.30 in the morning. It took me two minutes to get a ride. It was phenomenal. So it's great. It's pretty expensive, though, man. Taylor, <laughs> Taylor, we have a question here in the white jacket. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I'm a native of Oswego, New York, so I was right. by both you and Billy Barlow. Billy, um, Billy Barlow, I call him GQ Billy because he's like 25 years old, he's got perfect hair, and he's a mayor. I'm like, you suck, man. He's got it all made already. You know? <laughs> the unfortunate part is he also is stepping down, um, not stepping down, but actually moving on from his position as mayor as you are also moving on from your position. So I'm mostly trying to figure out what should I look forward to mm -hmm. and what should I look um, into the next generation who takes over? What should we look in these individuals who are going to become our next politicians? Well, I can tell you this much. The beauty of our system and the, and the genius of our forefathers uh, was that uh, uh, you're supposed to be, a, it's supposed to be citizen service, right? You get in, you serve, you get out. I think they'd be horrified to see members of Congress there 40 years or, or politicians that are there into their 90s and whatever. That, that's not what they had in mind, right? So the constant turning over is a good thing. It's a great thing. I mean, hell, I was never in politics. Now I'm in, I'm in Congress. I was 52 years old. I didn't even, I, looking back at my first campaign, I don't know how we won. Because how we ran it and how we, had, we, we did a great job what we had, but considering what we do now, it's pretty amazing, right? So it, that's the genius of our, our, of our country. And it's really cool that our country was set up in this way where anybody from anywhere can run at any time and get elected. And I have people in Congress looking like, how the hell did you get here? You know, <laughs> really. But um, uh, they got her because the system is what it is. And so uh, you just hope to God that, you know, people... Uh, percolate to the top that should. Listen, there's six Democrats running for my seat right now and a couple of Republicans, and it's great. The more, let, let, let the cream rise to the top and whoever gets it, we, we should all support as best we can. And I, I think that's the genius of our system. So I would be excited about the fact that you could turn around tomorrow if you wanted to run and run. And that's, not, there's not many countries, believe it or not, that have that much uh, uh, openness to them. You know, and uh, there's some bad things about that, and uh, you can see that in Congress, but it, there's also a lot of good things about it. You see guys like Billy, who's done a tremendous job at an incredibly young age. He's terrific, and uh, he's the best of what we have in this country, for sure. For sure. I think we have a question right here in the front. Thank you, Congressman Cockle, Professor Reeder, and Demon Slack. Um, Congressman, eight years ago, your first victory speech, you were purple tie, and at the point you said it's a symbol of the uh, bipartisanship because it's a combination of red and blue. Today you're obviously not wearing a tie today, not <laughs> speculating anything, but yeah, you've spent... I still have that tie, by the way. Nice. Um, <laughs> you spent most of the time talking about you, uh, the eight, uh, past eight years you've been pushing for bipartisanship in Washington, and now, eight years later, you're um, not seeking re-election this year, so um, my question is, like, what's your message to your successor and What's our vision for um, Central New York and the city of Syracuse under their representation? Well, I'd like to hope. To, I'd, I'd like to hope that um, I set an example that uh, maybe my successors can follow. That you got to deal with the other side, and you got to take into consideration the other side. And if and if if I've left nothing else as a legacy, I'd be very happy about that. To be honest with you, um, yeah, and I. Uh, you know, to think that I started out that way and ended up that way is pretty cool. I think last term, uh, I had the top overperforming race out of 435. In other words, uh, President Trump lost by 10 and I won by 10 uh, in this district. And that's a top in the country. And uh, at the same time, I was ranked, I think, second, I think second, number second most bipartisan member in all of Congress behind Fitzpatrick, my buddy. So I always told Fitzpatrick, if some, something happens to you, they're going to blame me because... <laughs> I, mean, I don't like being number one, but you know, no. But so I think just the bottom line is you, you just hope that other people can see that what, it's not rocket science, but I, I, maybe I set a template that others can follow. That's what I hope. We'll see. If you would hand the microphone to the gentleman right behind you, and yeah. then we have two questions well, in the back. Thanks for the opportunity. Sure. And I have a kind of sensitive question. Yeah. Mm. Is, what do you think, is China the biggest uh, competitor for the United States, like President Joe Biden said, or the China is the biggest enemy for the United biggest States? Biggest what, enemy? Enemy, yeah. I think both. And, and I'll tell you why. Uh, some of the biggest 
attacks done on this country are, are, were from Chinese state-sponsored uh, attacks. That's a, that's a fact, right? Uh, and it's a fact that China has a very ambitious and aggressive agenda. It's also a fact that China, as we speak, is engaged in unspeakable human rights violations that people tend to turn a blind eye to because of money, because of business. And that's to me, is, is, is not good for as a country. But I also understand that China can be a great actor on the world stage, uh, um, but they've got to change their tune. And uh, it just goes to show you what a leader can do to a country. And I think President Xi has, has, uh, is a very, very um, troubling character. And just like I think uh, President Putin is in Russia. And uh, that, you know, Russia, the United States doesn't have designs on taking over the world. They, they have designs on being peaceful. China has designs on taking over the world under this regime. And under a different regime, could it be different? Absolutely. But uh, we would be fools if we didn't think that China is looking at Taiwan right now and wondering, okay, uh, how's this all going in Ukraine? And uh, uh, what's the world's response? And I'm hoping that the world's response gives them pause because whatever sanctions you put on Russia, if we put similar sanctions on China, it would destroy their economy because they're so much more intertwined, intertwined with the world stage than Russia could ever hope of being. Russia's economy is the size of Texas economy, right? China's is the largest in the world, one of the largest in the world. So I think if China wants to be a good citizen, I think it would be phenomenal what they could do for the world. But they're showing an awful lot of aggression, which is deeply troubling. Now, do we, ha do we have things we need to do to assuage some of their concerns? Yeah, but they need to be better corporate citizens, I mean, they're better world citizens than they are right now, or we're gonna have a real problem. We have a question here in the back. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for taking the time to speak with us today. This is more of a social question and less of a government question, but I just wanted to hear your take on it because you're a moderate. Um, so I'm a huge passionate belief in the views of our founding fathers, truth, justice, and the American dream. But lately, it seems that in our society, we think of those views as negative and the views of the founding fathers as negative. So how do we make... It's going to sound bit naive probably, but how do we make America believe in these ideas again? Or do you think that these ideas need to be evolved into different ideas? I, I, I think America's always evolving. That's a genius of America. And I would say that the Constitution is a living, breathing document. I, it's really remarkable what they figured out to do. But think about at the very inflection point of how our country is formed. They were at a breaking point at the Constitutional Convention because the big states like Virginia wanted uh, proportional representation both the House and Senate, and that was the deal breaker. Finally, they had the Connecticut Compromise, I think they called it, where they had the, the two in the Senate and, uh, and then, uh, then proportional in the House, and uh, that really saved the union in a way, because without that, I don't think we would have ever had an agreement, right? And you would have had it broken up into small little disparate countries. And so um, the, the foundation of our country was, was founded on compromise, right? And we've got to get back to that. And I think we will. Um, and I think with better leadership all the way around, we, we can. These are tough times. I, I think the media plays a very big role in it, in, in that, um, like I said, divisiveness sells, right? People watch the news when, there's, when, it, when the people love a car accident, if you will, politically or otherwise. And uh, that's something we've got to work on in this country. But um, make no mistake about it. If, if we don't look at the other side's point of view, we're in big trouble. And that's why I think there's perception in ours we're in trouble right now, but we'll get back to it. We just gotta get, we gotta get the right people in the right positions of power. So I think we have two more questions. We have one here in the back and one over here. Hello, thank you for coming to Syracuse University. Where are you? I can't see you. Oh. There you are. Okay, I see you, okay, there you are. Should I stand up? No, I got you, I see you now, okay. fine. <laughs> so I want to say thank you for coming to Syracuse University. As you can see, in New York City, a lot of crimes have increased, and I am part of, I am from New York City. As you can see, like 23 people were attacked, and they were completely injured, and there are many crimes that's continuously happening in, in the city. So how can you ensure the safety of the people there? Well, it's a great example of seeing the other side of things, okay? There's a lot of people in this country because of what happened to George Floyd and some of the systemic racism that has happened in this country that all cops are bad, but it's just not true. 
the vast majority of cops are great, but we gotta acknowledge some cops are bad, some cops are racist, and we need to retrain our police, and we need to um, uh, make sure that they understand it and, and weed out the bad apples, right? Minneapolis, for example, right? Uh, the, the piece of garbage who killed George Floyd had 17 prior disciplinary arrests against him. What the hell was he doing with a guy who was on the force two days training him? Right? Those things shouldn't happen. But you don't hear about all the great things cops do. Like, for example, they found this guy within a day who did this awful life in New York City. They did great work. And the NYPD is probably the greatest police force in, 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 the, in the world, hands down. But I, you know, as part of this American Security Task Force I'm on, I'm traveling the country, and the, you know, by the way, New York City's police, after the George Floyd incident, they cut their budget by almost one sixth. That's not a good idea, and the result is obvious. So I think we've got to acknowledge that not all our cops are great. We've got to acknowledge that we've got, we've got problems, we've got to fix them. And the other side's got to acknowledge that you can't defund them. We've got, to, we've got to give them more tools to do their job in a better way. One thing we always did, and uh, when I was a prosecutor that we got away from is community policing, right? Uh, we had things called weed and seed, for example, where you take, uh, you go in a community and you work with the community and say, okay, third and main, you guys are the leaders, tell us if there's any problems here. They say, yeah, these guys are all problems. And so, you know, they're dealing drugs or doing whatever. You go and you do a sweep in that area, you arrest the bad guys, and then you provide seed money to help that, that neighborhood sustain itself and get more economically vibrant. Those are types of things we can do that we're, we've gotten away from. So I think both sides, it's a perfect example we've got to give. And in New York City, I think they're starting to realize that Mayor Adams, who's a Democrat, but is also a, a former cop, understands that um, a lot of the laws in New York State that were designed to try and fix things like bail laws, and the bail laws for sure are a problem, absolutely, right? We didn't have bail in the federal system, right? You, are you a danger to the community? Are you at risk of taking off? If you're one of those two things, you didn't get out. But if you weren't one of those two things, you got out, right? Pending trial. You can do the same thing in New York State. So there's things we can do with a give and take, and it's going to have to be less partisan, should be more uh, sitting down and talking to each other. And I think what's going on in New York City is forcing them to the table, and I think ultimately you can see a safer city. And what we're going to do with the, with the task force is one of the big things is uh, recommend a lot more what they call cops grants, which gets a lot more cops on the street, and uh, getting them out of police cars and interacting with the neighborhoods, community policing type uh, things, which would be really important. We have time for one last question in the back here, Corey. Sorry. Someone had their hand up. There we go. I think we're having hang a hard second. time hang hearing on you. One second. Is this working? Yes. That's working. There you go. Um, Congressman Keiko, thank you for talking to, us, uh, talking to us today. I wanted to take us back to the confrontation maybe with China and the international policy, the foreign policy of the United States. Um, I think, like, and I'm sorry to see you going from the Congress. I think less and less people are like you who have the resolve are there now to um, take any solid action or any solid position. Um, but I think the United States, if we think back about Syria, um, when the Congress maybe was a little bit more united rather than divided in the days of Obama, and Mr. Obama failed to like act on his red lines then. Mm -hmm. And I think after then, Russia acted in Syria, China became more aggressive against their minorities, mm -hmm. And the world is becoming a little more chaotic rather than having more order. So what is the future of the foreign policy and what is the future of the world do you see within a house that's a little bit more divided? Maybe? So let me sum that up as best I can. And this is my personal belief. I don't know if it's any of yours, and I'm sure some of you may differ. But um, I met with a bunch of members of the Australian Parliament a couple of weeks ago, about, about a month ago. And they said, the world is safest when America is strong and NATO is strong. And what happened before Ukraine was that we were not strong from a foreign policy standpoint. Look at Afghanistan, the way we left there. You can argue all you want whether we should have left, that's fine. The way we left really betrayed weakness badly by us and looked like we were just not on our game, right? And then you look at uh, all the major cyber attacks we've had from China and Russia in the last year and a half, and we've done nothing about it. We haven't, we haven't clapped back even once, right? And then you see um, uh, the massing of troops in Ukraine and people begging to get the arms to, uh, uh, to defend themselves to, to Ukraine before it happened, and we didn't do it, right? And now that's happened, we're doing it. So 
that's one of my concerns is that um, we are not an imperialistic nation. We don't want to take over things, but for whether we like it or not, the world depends on us, at least the free world, uh, depends on us to be that, uh, to, to be strong. And when we're strong, bad guys understand it. It's the most fundamental precept of any kind of conflict anywhere. When I was going after, it, it, Ukraine, for example, and I don't want to go off on this, but I'm just going to say this. Ukraine, uh, when we told them ahead of time, we're not going under any circumstance, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do this, but don't you do it. It'd be like me going into the gangs in Syracuse, same time ahead of time, we're going to investigate you, we want you to stop, but no matter what, we're not going to charge you with anything. Is that going to work? Or are those guys going to go nuts and have, a, have free, free fall in, in the community, right? So our foreign policy has got to be smarter. I am absolutely not a warmonger. I don't want to have, I want peace at any cost. My son's in the military. I don't want to see him in trouble. Right? He's a cavalry officer. I don't want to see him going to war. But um, the bad guys only understand strength, and we haven't projected strength on the world stage like we should. Um, I think last term it was more they didn't know what he was going to do. So therefore, there was a deterrent, but that's not a good deterrent. A good deterrent is strength. Okay, Clinton projected a lot of strength, and so did Reagan. I keep going back to those two because they, they, they were pretty damn good. I mean, Clinton's personal stuff aside, they understood. Strength is a good thing. And the, the one thing that's odd about what happened in Ukraine is NATO is never going to be stronger. And now NATO will be very strong going forward. But that doesn't help the people of Ukraine right now, right? And we, we've got to understand, China's got to understand, and any other people are thinking of stepping out, have got to understand that unless we are strong, uh, we are going to, the, the world is a less safe place overall. Whether we like it or not, that's our position in the world, and we have to deal with that. We have to embrace it. Thank you so much for all of these questions. I'd like to now welcome back up Professor O'Keefe. Thank you all very much. That was just extraordinary, Congressman. And Provost Reuter, thank you very much for really engaging a very spirited dialogue I think that we all benefited by. Over the course of our nearly two and a half centuries as a republic engaged in this most fragile experiment in democracy, the nation has experienced challenges sustaining this unique governance model and withstood a few periods of near existential consequence. But this American political experiment has persisted consequent to the generation of those who have believed in the value of citizenship at the core of who we are. Indeed, it is just the, I, that idealism that inspired the founding of the Syracuse University Maxwell School nearly 100 years ago. And at the foundation of this preeminent ranked institution, in this conviction that citizenship is a responsibility, first and foremost, a responsibility that must be passed through the generations and we must be led by those we believe are persevering in the very principles and values that make citizenship engagement possible and productive. Congressman Katko, you are among that successive group of generational leaders who have demonstrated the persistence and courage to preserve this experiment for the next generation of citizens, many of them in this audience of students who will inherit it and who are expected to carry on that responsibility as well. We thank you for your role in all of that and being a role model to all of us. And as a small expression of our appreciation, we want to present to you something that is very emblematic of the Maxwell School and citizenship as its core, etched in that building over there, uh, that very clearly identifies this as a responsibility that each of us have to do the best we have in any public service condition in the hopes of leaving it better than the way we found it. That's what's etched in this. I invite you all to join us for a reception in the Eggers Commons. Uh, and again, our deepest thanks, Congressman, for spending the time with us this afternoon. It was very enlightening. I mean, go, go get into public service. Give it a whirl.
It's hey, all right. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you.